What is it we fear lurking in the darkness just beyond our sight, dwelling in the distant reaches of the mountains, in the deep places in the earth, or in the storm-tossed sea where giant forms loom out of the misty waters? In fairy tales and ancient myths, these are dwelling places of the trolls or Jotnar, often deadly to mortals. Only the mightiest of the gods, Thor, is able to deal destruction against these dreadful foes of mankind. But what are they exactly? Were they always just seen as giant monsters? Or is there a more sophisticated concept lurking there also, hidden behind the words of ancient Norse skalds? What really are trolls? Hi friends, I'm Kevin McLean. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and consider supporting the channel through Patreon or PayPal. Despite being used widely in English, the word troll is likely borrowed from Norwegian or Danish. It doesn't appear in any surviving Old English sources. In Old Norse, it carries the meaning of monster, sorcerer, witch, and can be seen in other derived terms like Swedish trolla, to conjure. Its Proto-Germanic origin developed from trudena, meaning to tread or step on. Sometimes this is explained as having come from a description of the strange walk of the monstrous creature, but I will provide an alternative explanation which I think is much more likely, that it is a diminutive term to refer to an evil creature which is trod upon, referring at once to its chthonic nature but also its status as a defeated enemy. In Germanic myth, Thor is the god called upon to battle trolls. He's fundamentally the same as the Celtic god represented on the Jupiter columns in Roman Gaul, where the thunder god crushes a monster beneath the hooves of his horse. In some surviving artifacts from Britain, the god stamps upon the head of the enemy with his own foot treading upon the defeated monster, driving it down into the earth or the sea, is part of the mythical concept around these beings, forming at least one of the names that they were known by in Germanic traditions. Now while Anglo-Saxons do not appear to have used the word troll, they call the same beings Thurse, which also appears in Old Norse as Thurs and is used interchangeably with Troll and Jotun. It's found in all Germanic languages and comes from a Proto-Indo-European root meaning powerful, strong, or quick. But one of the most well-known and common names that they are known by is Jotun, which also appears in Old English as Eotun, sometimes modernized as Etun. It is often used interchangeably with Thurs and Troll and goes back to a root referring to consuming or a glutton. Think of the word eat or eaten in English. This nature is suggested in an account provided by the skald Bragi Boldason. They call me a troll, moon of the earth brawler, Jotun's wealth sucker, storm sun's bale, beloved follower of the Volva, guardian of the Nathjarvar, Swallower of the Wheel of Heaven, what's a troll if not that? As a wealth sucker, the gluttonous troll destroys that which is flourishing and productive. They are the bane of the light, which is the sun's storm. They even swallow the sun and or the moon, a very gluttonous act. Yet this act also suggests that what is here called a troll is elsewhere called Jotun. For elsewhere, this feat is ascribed to the offspring of Fenrir. Of this, the Voluspa says, East sat the crone in Irnvidr, Fenrir's progeny. Of all shall be, one especially, the moon's devourer, in a troll's semblance. He is sated with the last breath of dying men. The god's seat, he with red gore defiles 
Swart is the sunshine then, for summers after, all weather turns to storm. Understand ye yet, or what? In the prose edda, this passage is explained by the figure Har as a witch dwells in the east of Midgarth, in a forest called Ironwood. In that wood dwells the troll women, who are known as Ironwood women. The old witch bears many giants for sons, and all in the shape of wolves, and from this source are those wolves sprung. The saying runs thus, From this race shall come one that shall be mightiest of all, he that is named Moonhound. He shall be filled with the flesh of all those men that die, and he shall swallow the moon and sprinkle with blood the heavens and all the lair. Thereof shall the sun lose her shining, and the winds in that day shall be unquiet and roar on every side. The last unanswered riddle about the description of the troll is why the troll is called a devout follower of the Volva. The answer can be found in Baldur's Dramar, where Odin ventures into the east to find the Volva, who will tell him the fate of his son. He says, You are not a Volva, or a wise woman. Rather, you are the mother of the three Thurses. This Volva would seem to be none other than Angerboda, who together with Loki was the mother of the three great monsters, Jormungandr, Fenrir and Hel. She's very likely the crone or witch referred to as dwelling in the east in Ironwood, the mother of wolves. By the time of our sources, trolls, Jotun, and Thurs seem to refer to the same class of beings. However, there may have originally been a distinction. The first Jotun is Ymir, and from his body the material world was fashioned. His skull became the sky, his brains the clouds, his flesh the earth, his blood the sea, his bones the mountains. The entirety of the physical world is formed of a Jotun. Egir, the sea, and his brothers Logi, fire, and Kari, wind, are all Jotun. The earth, Jord, mother of Thor, is also described as a Jotun, though sometimes she's also accounted one of the gods. The nature of others is not always clear, but most personifications of the environment that are named are Jotun, as they are formed out of the body of the first Jotun, who represents the totality of the material world. The original nature of this first Jotun is somewhat mysterious. We are told in Snorri's prose edda that he was formed when the heat of Muspelheim met with the frozen ice of Niflheim. Some of the ice began to melt, and from that dripping water was formed Ymir, the first of the Jotun. His other name was Argelmir, meaning something like the wet bellowing one. He's also known as Brimir, possibly wetness or moisture, and used to refer to him in reference to the sea that was formed from his blood. A number of times in poetry he is called Thorn, meaning thorn or thorn bush. This indicates that he is the same as the Jotun named Bolthor, the evil thorn, who is the father or sometimes grandfather of Odin's mother, Besla. Bolthorn has a Welsh cognate, the leader of the giants, Uzbathadin, whose name means thorn bush. In Havamal, the skald in the voice of Odin says, Nine magic songs I got from the famous son of Bolthorn, Besla's father. It refers to Mimir, identified as the uncle of Odin, who is the grandson of the first giant, whom he slays in the creation of the world. Though numerous times Ymir is said to be the progenitor of the Jotun, a different origin is given for beings sometimes called Jotun, but other times called Trolls, Thurs, or other names. In the short Voluspa it says, Lofter became pregnant with an evil woman. From that in the world is every troll woman come. Lofter or Lopter is one of the names for Loki and means air 
or sometimes sky. Despite a widespread view, Loki was not the god of fire. This idea comes from a false etymology of Loki's name, equating it with Logi, meaning fire. Rather, his name appears to be related to knots or binding. Consider the word lock in English. In Swedish, a cobweb is called lokenat. Daddy long legs are called lokespindler, Loki's spider. In a few cases, he is connected also with nets. Likely, he represents tangles, obstructions, and disorder, and links to spiders hardly give a positive impression of how he was imagined. For his bad deeds, he was eventually cast down by the gods and bound beneath the earth. Earthquakes are ascribed to his movement. He was the father of Jormungandr, Fenrir, and Hel. Their mother was Angarboda, and from these two every troll woman has come, or every wolf as is said elsewhere. The children of Loki are the primary forces of Ragnarok who will kill Odin and Thor. Now we could speculate that these beings who are offspring of Loki are different from the offspring of Ymir, the primordial beings of nature. However, there is no clear distinction in our sources, as the wolf Fenrir swallows Odin and his offspring swallow the sun and moon, and as real wolves are known as gluttonous, calling them Jotun, the gluttons, seems pretty fitting. Yet there does seem to be some real functional difference between these chaotic, destructive beings and those primordial beings who form the physical world. Though sometimes monstrous or wolfish, trolls do not necessarily have a definitive physical appearance. In Alvismal, Thor says, What is this creature? Why are you so pale around the nose? Have you been with corpses at night? A likeness to Thorsus, there seems to me to be about you. The being he is speaking about is later identified as a Dvergar, or dwarf. But like trolls in later folklore, the dwarf turns to stone upon sunrise. That a thurs or troll could be mistaken for a dwarf means that in appearance they were at one time thought to be very similar and had the look of a dead person. They are all said to dwell in the north, in separate regions of Jotunheim. Other times they are closely connected with wolves. One kenning or poetic name for a wolf in Old Norse is Horse of the Troll Woman, and in a number of tales they appear riding atop wolves. There is an attachment also with knowledge and magic, and the ability to shape change, especially into the form of a wolf. In the story of the Volsungs it says, But some men say that this same she-wolf was the mother of King Sigurd who had turned herself into the likeness by troll's lore and witchcraft. In Swedish, trolla means to conjure, and various related meanings appear in other Germanic languages as well, which attest to this relation between trolls and magic. The Volsung's tale recounts the deeds of Sigmund in wolf form, saying, Now that day they might not come out of their wolf skins, but Sigmund lays the other on his back and bears him home to the house and cursed the wolf gears and gave them to the trolls. Thereafter they went home to their earth house and abode there till the time came for them to put off their wolf shapes. Then they burnt them up with fire. The act of shape changing is in some way connected to the power of the trolls. Sigmund is suggested to be the son of a troll woman. Hrimnir, the giant, sends to him Loth, his daughter. So Volsung weds her with all, and long they abode together with good hap and great love. They had ten sons and one daughter, and their eldest son was Sigmund, and their daughter Signy, and these two were twins. This theme is found also in the lay of Helgi Hjorvardsson. Heathen was at home with his father, King Hjorvard, in Norway. Returning home alone from the forest on a Yule Eve, Heathen met a troll wife riding on a wolf with serpents for reins, who offered to attend him, but he declined her offer, whereupon she said, 
Thou shalt pay for this at the braggy cup. That evening the great vows were taken. The sacred boar was brought in. The men laid their hands thereon and took their vows at the king's toast. Hethin vowed that he would have Svava, Elemi's daughter, the beloved of his brother Helgi. Then such great grief seized him that he went forth on wild paths southward over the land. The troll's curse caused him to make a foolish vow, possibly during a moment of uncontrollable passion. This is also reflected in the prose edda which says, Passion should be paraphrased by calling it wind of troll women, and to name giants paraphrasing giantesses as women or mother or daughter of the giants. The force of passion and desire and the object of desire is somehow connected to trolls, and this isn't the only instance. Another poem reads, As from the east, out of Elivigar, comes a thorn from the field of the Rimacol giants, with which Dane smites all men of the glorious Midgarth every night. Actions are numbed, the arms slump, a swoon hovers over, the white god's sword, stupor dispels the wind of the giantess, the mind's workings of all mankind. What is translated as wind of the giantess is identical to what the prose edda calls the wind of troll women, passion or emotion which drives mental activity. It's dispelled when sleep is brought on at night by the thorn of the dwarf Dane, which causes the white god, Heimdallr, his sword, being the head of the human, to swoon. There is some mysterious connection between these trolls or giants and the workings of human desire and mind more broadly. The mead of poetry is also known as the mead of Sutungr, the giant who possessed it and from whom it must be stolen by Odin. Though externalized in myth, there is something fundamentally internal about these tales that relates to consciousness. Sultangar may mean heavy with drink, suggesting the state of drunkenness. His daughter is named Gunloth, meaning battle invitation, who gives over the mead to Odin. One can read this as Odin, through intoxication, gains battle lust and through this access to poetic fury. Odin seeks out the giant Vafthrudnir, mighty entangler, to have a contest of wits. It may be that this giant represents mental confusion whom Odin strives against as a seeker of knowledge. He is the father of Im, possibly related to Ymir, meaning a wolf or giant and Ima, meaning battle, related to an old Germanic word for anger. Though some suggest that trolls or Jotun were thought to be stupid, our medieval sources seem to suggest the opposite. Part of their tales do involve the gods having to outwit them, but often through trickery. A poem called Groa's Spell says, The ninth will I chant thee, if needs thou must strive with a warlike giants in words. Thy heart good store of wit shall have, and thy mouth of words full wise. This implies having to overcome a giant through some form of mental contest, similar to what we see Odin engage in, and possibly also reflected in Thor's trick of the dwarf. The giants seem to be able to cause mental confusion and dim-wittedness in people, rather than being dim-witted themselves. Or perhaps it is that these particular Jotun are these mental states. One source of Odin's knowledge is the head of the Jotun Mimir, which gives him counsel. Odin also sacrificed his eye into Mimir's pool in order to obtain a drink from the well of the famously wise giant that would grant him great knowledge. The well is located under one of the roots of the Yggdrasil in the north, in the realm of the Frost Jotun. A kenning for Jotun is mischievous Mimir. But what does this mean concretely? 
Mimir's name is related to an Indo-European root meaning mind, thought, reflection, and probably also related to English memory. The identity of Mimir seems to be as part of the basic function of the mind. A mischief Mimir would then perhaps be a bad or tricky thought or a dysfunction of the mind in some way. The nature of a number of Jotun and Trolls are thus related not only to the external world, but are also found within the mind of man, such as causing forgetfulness, dim-wittedness, stupor, excessive passions. That Thor is the primary god to stand against the Trolls and the Jotun also tells us something more about him as well. If the troll is not only some unruly monster without, but also within, then Thor is concerned with a mastery over the self and the dominance of the ego over the subconscious forces, while Odin sneaks into that subconscious realm searching for secrets and stealing hidden knowledge and often fraternizing with Jotun. Thor is concerned with keeping these forces in their place and smashing them down when needed. He is the chariot-driving god, which keeps mind and body under the domination of the ego, striving towards the objective. Externally, Thor's thunderbolt drives away evil spirits, disperses the dark clouds, and brings the sunlight. Internally, he dispels the fog and confusion of the mind, bringing clarity and understanding. This may be reflected in one of the curses that Thor lays upon Odin's hero, Starkather, that he never be able to remember the skaldic poems, even though Odin has gifted him with the skill to compose them. In the physical world, the giants may have been associated with the night sky. In the prose edda it says, the chariot god who swiftly wrought grief to the giant's bench thanes, he to whom hosts make offering, hewed down the dolt like dwellers of the cloud abyss of Elfholm. Elfholm is in the earth, but also in the dark night sky. It seems that it was thought that in the day, the night sky and its dwellers were beneath the earth. The dark, sky-obstructing clouds may have been home to certain trolls, just as the Vedic Vrtra, enemy of Indra, dwells in the dark clouds. They are also linked to the north. The Hravnagaldr says, At the Ormungun's northern border, under the outmost root of the noble tree, went to their couches giantesses and giants, dead men, dwarves, and dark elves. The Jotun Hrungnir was said to be the strongest of the Jotun. He was made of stone, and was accompanied by a Jotun made of clay. Thor's battle with him is recalled in the Prose Edda. Swiftly the shining shield rim shot neath the cliff ward's shoe soles. That was the wise god's mandate. The war Valkyries willed it. The champion of the wasteland, not long thereafter waited, for the speedy blow delivered by the friend of the troll's face crusher. Hrangnir is said to be the defender of the cliffs, a champion of the wilds. His name is thought by some to mean noisemaker or brawler. However, the important thing about Hrangnir is that he is made of stone. He also hurls a stone at Thor, which the god's hammer shatters, and is said to be the origin of all the slate in the world. When Thor's lightning bolt strikes his head, it bursts into fragments, and perhaps was also thought to be the origin of many a stone. A kenning for Thor made in Thor's drapa calls him Furious Scatter of the Scree Villain. Scree is a collection of loose stone fragments on the side of mountains. Hrungnir's name may be related to Icelandic Hrungl, meaning a loose structure or fragmented ice, perhaps at one time Scree or something like it. Almost certainly this Scree villain 
that Thor is credited with having defeated is another name for Hrungnir. The tale may tell of when a mountain tried to rise up to heavens and was smashed down by Thor, but left a jagged fragment in his forehead, the peak of the mountain that touches the sky. Hrungnir also has the second greatest horse in the world, Golfaxi, meaning golden mane, which Thor gets after having defeated the giant. It's only slightly slower than Odin's horse. Golfaxi can be compared with the horses Skidfaxi, the horse of day, and Hrimfaxi, the horse of night. Golfaxi is likely to be of a similar nature given the identical structure of his name, and is possibly related to the rising sun liberated from the obstructing mountain by Thor, though only one theory. While Hrungnir is a chief example of the Jotun of the mountains, there are also those who have a watery nature and live by or in the sea. This nature, of course, is connected to Jormungandr, the giant serpent that surrounds the world, dwelling in the encircling sea on the borders, which Thor once combats upon a small boat. However, this is also at the center of his battle with Gerrother, best recalled in the 10th century poem Thor's Drapa. In this earlier account, Thor makes his way across the northern sea. He contested with the powerful currents, the icy waves, and the slippery stones. The waves crested over top Thor, driven by a fierce tempest as the god waded the waters. And his journey through those waters makes up the majority of the poem, during which waves are referred to as the widows of the Mimir of Mischief, meaning windows of the Jotun. It says that Thor and Thialfi are the destroyers of the nation of the seashore, and calls giants the scary nation of the cold waves of the foe Sweden, and the Danes of the flood rib of the outlying sanctuary. The prose Edda names two of the troll women that try to kill Thor on his way to Gerover, Gjalp referring to the sea or wave, and Grepa referring to grasping or seizing. Their names appear also on the list of the nine mothers of Heimdall. After Thor enters the cave of Gerother, they try to lift him into the ceiling and crush him. The poem states, They force the high heaven of the flame of the brow moon against the rafters of the hall and were crushed against the rocks of the plain. The hull controller of the hovering chariot of the thunderstorm broke the ancient keel of the laughter ship of both cave maidens. What is the action taking place here? Perhaps Thor is being forced upward by the tide, which seizes him and pushes him forward, which he then forces back down. In another account, one of the daughters of Gerother is flooding the river, which Thor is struggling to cross. Thor puts an end to it with a well-thrown rock. It shows that this giantess linked to Gerother are connected to water in some important way, and Gerother, whose name means spear redner, may be a cloud giant or water withholder of some type. Gerother tries to kill Thor by throwing a red-hot piece of iron at him, perhaps a thunderbolt. Thor catches it and casts it back at him striking through the giant's cover and killing him. This episode and the connection between the Jotun and the waters is strikingly similar to the giants in Gaelic mythology, being called the Fumors, those who dwell beneath the sea. In the tale of Beowulf, we may have an example of an Anglo-Saxon troll linked to water. Grendel and his mother are identified as monsters. It says, So live the clansmen in cheer and revel, a winsome life till one began, to fashion evils that field of hell. Grendel this monster grim was called. March reaver, mighty in moorland dwelling, in fen and fastness, fief of the giants. 
the hapless white a while had kept, since the Creator his exile doomed. Of Cain awoke all that woeful breed, Eutans and elves and evil spirits, as well as the giants that warred with God. Many monster tales of ancient origin seem to relate to plagues, and with Grendel the same may be the case. The hero must have the physical force to drive off this evil spirit, and this power to drive off that spirit is connected to Thor in Germanic traditions, and he is the one with the power to hallow. Hallowing, or to make holy, requires the power to drive off evil. Beowulf defeats Grendel in a confrontation and then purifies the hall. He then follows Grendel back to his lair, dives under the waters, and destroys him and his mother in a cave under the water. And this is very similar to the tale that was just described relating to Thor, crossing the waters in order to get to a cave. Many heroic tales of battling monsters or dragons are in fact representations of battling the spiritual forces that are causing a plague or drought. This nature of the troll as a harmful spirit may relate to a chant found in a 16th century English book of antiquities. Trolle onoe, trolle onoe, singe heve on hoe, rom beloe trolle onoe. It may be part of a New Year's tradition which chased away trolls, driving them beneath the sea. In Horbarsloth, Thor says of the giants, Eastward I fared, of the giants I felled, their ill-working women who went to the mountains, and large were the giants' throng. If all were alive, no men would there be in Midgard's moor. This reinforces the notion that the giants are dangerous forces that must be combated or controlled for the sake of mankind, though their exact nature in each case seems to differ. Sometimes they are raw forces of nature, other times they are deadly plagues, other times they are mental obstructions. They can lurk in the dark waiting to devour or roam in the subconscious of man, obstructing thought or giving rise to deadly passions. In the case of Mimir, they may be memory or mind itself, informing Odin of all. The force of Thor, the defender of mankind, is brought to bear against those who become unruly, safeguarding against them in all of their myriad forms. I hope you liked this video, and if you did, Please give a like, subscribe, and consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. Support's very much appreciated. Thanks for watching, and as always, stand tall.